Greetings, Audio Avengers. Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, a podcast tackling our collective obsession with the latest releases from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that means we're continuing our discussion of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, episode number five, titled very beautifully and accurately, Truth. Every week we analyze the newest chapter of the MCU from three angles you will only find on this podcast. Our story cast is live, and Amanda and Maeve explore two main themes of the episode. The heroism of the ordinary, and how it's often the little things that we do that make the biggest difference, and also the importance of, and difficulties of, self-determination. On Wednesday's Ponder Vision, Jesse Taylor and I are going to dive into the most entertaining and creative questions that we have for each other as we look ahead to the final episode. We will ponder everything from how the Wakandans got Sam's fingerprint to the depths of Steve Rogers' problematic blind spots. But now it's time for this show, our character cast. Here we explore the episodes of Marvel TV through the lenses of the characters themselves. And this episode was almost entirely about massive character growth, so we have a lot to discuss, folks. I'm your host, Mark Folletti, and to help me understand these characters better is an attorney and policy genius that I wish was running the GRC, Christine Kippens. Hi, Christine. Hello. I hear your puppy sitting this week. How's that going? I am, listen, I am a single woman with no responsibilities other than financial ones and having to take care of a living creature for the past four days has been (laughs) such an experience. Like my entire schedule has been dictated by this seven pound little adorable menace and I love him with my whole heart, but I don't know if I'm ever doing this again. Yeah, I also love dogs and grew up with dogs, but had a mom who could help me take care of them. And it would be, I don't know, be a bit of a stretch these days. Uh, You know, Amanda and I obviously aren't doing the kids thing uh, for the same reasons. It's like, seems like a lot of work, Uh, but I certainly love and respect all the parents in my circle, including, of course, Jesse and Jess and all the folks who are on the Marvelous TV Club uh, with kids. But look, we've got seven different characters to discuss today. And there's a ton to unpack for each of them. Our big seven are Isaiah, Sam, Bucky, Sarah, Walker, Carly, and Zemo. I think we're going to take our time with the first couple and then get a little more rapid fire with the others. But as always, Christine and I share my list of questions, but never our answers. So who knows how it'll play out? You ready to get into this, Christine? I'm beyond ready. Let's do it. Well, I think we should begin with Isaiah Bradley. How did you react to his life story the first time you watched him tell it? Ooh, it was heavy. I was floored, absolutely floored by this scene. It was so raw and real and utterly expected, but still managed to provide a punch to the throat. Yeah. So for me, Isaiah's story, absent all the super soldier serum stuff, Sounds like it could have happened to any black man in America in the 50s. Experimenting on black men under false pretenses has happened in America. It happened at Tuskegee with the syphilis experiment where they told black men for 40 years that they could help cure them of syphilis when all they did was watch them die of the disease long after penicillin was found to be a cure. It happened in the 40s when the government conducted secret mustard gas experiments on black soldiers to determine if they could be effective frontline soldiers so that white soldiers could be kept safe. Yeah. Listen, I can talk about surgical experiments done on enslaved women without anesthesia or the experiments on enslaved babies or the experiments on prisoners or on the mentally ill, but we ain't got that kind of time, Mark. So... The fact that the U.S. government secretly experimented on Isaiah Bradley and several other black men to see what type of super soldier serum would actually work, for me, that was basically ripped from history. And the rest of his story could, too. Steve Rogers went to Europe to do a USO show in the role of Captain America. Right. Finds out his best friend and his unit were captured by Hydra disobeys a direct order to leave well alone, frees all of the POWs, and is heralded a hero. Captain America stops being a showman and becomes an actual soldier. Isaiah Bradley does the same thing. 
He takes matters into his own hands to free his captured brothers, disobeying orders in the process, and his reward is enslavement. Yeah. The government told his wife he was dead. And for 30 years, they experimented on his body because they fucking owned it. Listen, I was ready for the vast majority of Isaiah's story, but I wasn't ready to hear that he was enslaved by the U.S. government for doing the exact same thing that put Steve Rogers on the map. To be clear, white people literally get away with murder and black people are killed for hanging air fresheners from their rearview mirrors. So it's not the fact that Steve wasn't punished and Isaiah and Isaiah was for doing the same exact thing that's surprising to me. It's just that I was not expecting to come on Character Cast today and talk about Isaiah Bradley being enslaved by the U.S. government for decades. So just when I realized that, it was like a fucking punch to the throat. Yeah. One of the things that really struck me the first time was about that inversion of Steve's story. Because mm-hmm. whether we like it or not, right, if you're going to talk about race in a public forum in America, like a TV show, it's always inevitably an argument because there are always people who are trying to make excuses for why it's not really the issue. But because they gave Isaiah's history the same plot as right. Steve, but a totally different story, that makes it really fucking hard to argue with the point. Because there's no amount of excuse, any excuse you could make for Isaiah, you could make for Steve or not make for Isaiah and not make for Steve. And putting people in a position to reckon with that is really powerful. And of course, at the same time, that inversion broke my heart precisely because I have obviously been as a fan of the MCU, like really invested in the white version of that story. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I had never asked myself what would have happened if a black soldier in the 40s had done the same. Right. The best case scenario for that answer is probably a court martial, right? right? Best like, case. So then when I realized that his punishment was actually enslavement and it's not internment, like he was not courted off from all of society and not asked to provide any type of labor or anything like that. That man labored for the US government by them extracting his body. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what happened to him when Steve Rogers got to parade about the best, the rest of Europe as a freaking hero. And compare what they did to Isaiah Bradley for disobeying orders exactly the same way that Steve Rogers did versus the empty threats they offer John Walker, who literally killed a man in front of the entire world who didn't deserve it while wearing the uniform. Right. John Walker's threatened with a court martial. Oh, he loses his benefits. That is completely disproportionate when you compare his actions to Isaiah's and what happened to Isaiah. And yet it's so reminiscent of what happens today in our society when you have police who folks try to hold to account and can't because of things like qualified immunity or the fact that they're brethren lie for them. They plant evidence. I mean, folks are allowed to quit so that they can still receive their pension and their other benefits that have accrued over time by, you know, providing service on the force. And that's completely allowed for killing innocent people on the street. Right. In America, a white mass shooter gets taken to Burger King for one last meal. Correct. And a black 13-year-old child with his hands up is gunned down. I mean, mm-hmm. that's, that's you know, the stuff that I think hit me about Isaiah's story. And obviously, you know, it's just, yeah. I mean, he speaks genuine truth to power more than any other MCU character through his story and his perspective. And I'm curious about, you know, among all of the things that we're talking about and Anything else that you considered, I guess, what's the most important thing you think the audience can take away from the story? Well, I hope one thing that they take away is that there are African-Americans who have contributed greatly to the progress of this American society, and you have never heard their names. They're not in any history books because they have been intentionally erased from public history. And why? 
because this country was built for and runs on white supremacy. Anything that counters that, especially the exceptionalism of indigenous people and people of color is a threat and either must be harnessed for furthering white supremacy or neutralized completely. Even Isaiah, they didn't send him into a European country to fight other white people. No, Isaiah and his brothers were sent to Korea to kill other people of color. And once he can no longer be used to further their means, they locked him up for doing exactly what Steve Rogers did and experimented on his body in secret because they saw him as chattel. Isaiah isn't a Marvel Cinematic Universe fantasy. He's a representation of all the nameless Black men and women the U.S. government and economy exploited and continues to exploit for white profit. Do you think that message is coming across? What you're saying is so powerful and important. Have you seen anything already in these first couple of days since release that, you know, suggests that this is being absorbed? I mean, I feel like some of the discourse on Twitter has been. I mean, we've we've kind of benefited from a supremely bad take that happened last week, yeah. you know, with the Dora Milaje. And I think people are starting to realize that this story the entire show is an exploration on what it means to be Black in today's society. And I think folks are starting to wake up. Of course, there are people who don't want to hear this message. Right. There are people who just want to stay ignorant and watch this show for the action and be a part of the Marvel moment, right? But I think folks who generally have their eyes open and are receiving what this show is trying to say, they're picking it up. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I mean, I can only speak to my perspective as a cis white guy, right? As someone who saw himself in Steve Rogers 10 years ago when his movies were coming out, but didn't stop to think as much about how that wasn't the case for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. For me, Isaiah's story conveyed that there, there's no such thing as a cinematic ending to this story for millions of black Americans, right? No matter how much better things get, you know, diversity and leadership cannot give Isaiah his 30 years back. Reparations cannot bring back people who were murdered by cops or their neighbors or restore like the countless histories that have been erased. We have to do all of those things and more, but there's no way to ever make this fully right. The only way forward for white Americans is to collectively accept that America has committed unforgivable sins against its own people. We have to make transformative change, but without the expectation that it ever lets white Americans believe that we're square now, whatever that even means, there is no, there's no such thing. And that might be something that a lot of white Americans find hard to live with. But I do, I do think that probably pales in comparison to what we've forced like BIPOC communities to live with for hundreds of years. And so as a, as a white American, that's something that I hope, you know, other white Americans take away from Isaiah's story. From your lips, Mark. <laughs> well, let's talk about the man Isaiah spent a lot of time talking with, Sam Wilson, Isaiah told Sam that no self-respecting black man would take up the mantle of Captain America. By the end of the episode, though, Sam does seem to feel differently. What do you think, Christine? Ooh, this this was a question that um, I actually grappled with soon after I first saw the episode. And I got pretty emotional thinking about it. So hopefully I can answer this question without completely losing my shit. It's a safe but, space here. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you. So, so here goes. Um, I get where Isaiah is coming from. He, he served his country and his country betrayed him. And he's well aware of a history of that happening to people who look like him. He represents the fact that white America has erased the stories and history of African Americans for 500 years. That's a fact. He mentions the Tuskegee Airmen, known for the red tails of their fighter planes in World War II, who are among the most decorated flyers in the U.S. Armed Service. While in service and when they came home as highly decorated veterans, they experienced racism. Surely, Nazi war prisoners were actually treated better than Tuskegee Airmen. Wow. So he knew that history going into his service. 
But he said he was like Sam. He was optimistic. That was the past. And, you know, the present had to be better. That's what you kind of have to tell yourself. But he learned it's just more of the same. And quite frankly, it might have been worse for Isaiah than history would have prepared him for. So I get the bitterness. I get the distrust. And I get the strong dislike of any symbol of the U.S. government, including the flag and the shield and the title of Captain America. I get it because I struggle with the same feelings every day. My parents came to this country in the 70s looking for greater opportunities than the ones that they could have had in their home country. They brought me up to believe in the power of democracy, the power of organizing, and to love this country. They fed me their optimism. And as a black woman of color who has now worked professionally on political campaigns and has organized people behind concepts and works on national policy proposals, it is damned hard to maintain that optimism for progress when every day you are reminded that this country hates you and everyone who looks like you or thinks like you and it is set up to exploit you and keep you in a state of second-class citizenship. It is damned hard to find the motivation to keep pushing for progress and change when you know the absolutely overwhelming history of atrocities committed by this country to people who look like you when you're bombarded with news stories of atrocities committed today to people who look like you and knowing that a fucking Nazi can be elected to the White House in this day and age. Why bother? Why do it? Why get paid so little to do so much work under so much stress for a country that hates me? But I do it because if I didn't, and the realization that if everyone who felt like this didn't keep putting one foot in front of the other in a commitment to progress, then white supremacy wins. And it can't. I have to continue building on the work and sacrifice of the people who came before me including my parents, with my own work and sacrifice and be an example to the next generations like Sam is for his nephews. That is the only way to honor them and the only way to move the ball forward. Sam says to Sarah, what would be the point of all the pain and sacrifice if I wasn't willing to stand up and keep fighting? And he's absolutely right. Becoming the next Captain America and building on Isaiah's legacy is the only way to honor him and what he went through. It's a legacy of blood. So it's only fitting that Sam finally starting to believe that he could be the next Captain America had to pick up the shield when it had the blood of a murdered displaced person on it. You cannot possibly accept the mantle of anything America without first acknowledging the grievous sins this country has committed and the blood and sacrifice of people fighting for freedom, equality, and equity. Sam couldn't accept that shit clean and spotless as Steve gave it to him. That clean shield was a fucking lie. America's history is one of bloodshed, and that piece of iconography was never more accurate than when it was anointed with Nico's bone and blood all over it. One of my favorite shots in the whole episode is when AJ takes up the position that Sam did in the On Your Left sequence from Winter Soldier. And, you know, is that what Sam's nephews represent in the story? Is the, the possibility of hope the reason to keep fighting for impossible change and to try to make it possible? 
100%. I mean, you it's always about the next generation. That's why my parents picked up all of their things, left Guyana, and came to the United States because of me, who didn't exist yet. Yeah. So it's it's always about progress, not just for you, but for the people who come next. It's a baton passing. And everybody's trying to get to that finish line, but you always pray that it's your children or your grandchildren who are going to be the final, they're going to be the, um, the anchor leg for that relay race. Mm -hmm. But God damn it, this has been a long relay race. Just hoping to see the end of it soon. But again, you always just think that and pray that it's your children who, who are carrying the final leg and they're the ones who get to reap the benefits of all the sacrifice that came before them. What do you think changed the most about Sam? Like, how did he grow or did his perspective change in this episode? I don't know if this is something that changed about him the most, but it's a it's a change that resonated deeply with me. So much so I cried when I saw it happening. There was a lot of crying happening during this episode. <laughs> well, it's, okay? it's, uh, yeah, well, I understand. <laughs> um, so Sam finally learning to ask for and accept help for me was a fucking breakthrough. Mm. I, to me, this was huge for Sam. When you're the kid to get out and make it, there is so much pressure to be perfect and not ask for any help. You don't want to be a burden to anyone. You just want to be the one that helps everyone else because you see how hard everyone else has it. Or you want to honor the sacrifice of the people who helped you get out and be successful, right? And fucking hell, if this isn't something that every immigrant kid and child of immigrants can identify with, I mean, I personally struggle with it every day. And I think it's a struggle for perfectionists, too. But it was really beautiful to see Stam stop trying to fix things on his own for once and to ask his community for help. For me, that was huge. Yeah, I love that. I, I think we start the season with Sam looking to institutions, military contracts, white owned banks. And, you know, he his institutionalism is where he is focusing his energies, both personally and also for his family. But in this episode, he turns back to the family itself and to the community around it, the Delacroix community, and works on the problems that are right in front of him, you know, because he tells Bucky to stop worrying about how other people define Bucky. But I also think Sam was you know, letting other people do the same to him, whether that's the military, the banks or America, when he felt like he had to hand over the shield, you know, that he wasn't, you know, Captain America ready to be Captain America, that he didn't feel like his shield. I I guess I think he embodies the two themes Amanda and Maeve talked about, you know, the heroism of the ordinary Mm -hmm. and also like taking your destiny, your self-determination into your own hands by doing the work. But I just I love that where he focused that energy was, again, family and community and a little less on these sort of larger, you know, uncaring at best institutions. Hostile, I think, is probably more accurate, especially in light of his conversation with Isaiah. Yeah, no, I agree with that 100%. Because every time he even offers for help, it's like, I know somebody. Like, I could go back to a particular institution to kind of help bring about whatever change needed to happen. But yeah, this was just about getting back to basics and relying on community and family to, again, move the ball forward. I love that for him. How do you want to see them stick the landing with Sam's arc in the finale? We only got one left. Listen, seeing Sam ask for help was just about all I needed for his (laughs) arc. Seeing him be the friend and therapist to Bucky, I knew he could always be was what I needed. Hearing him say, if there's one thing I've learned, it's that I can't win every fight was what I needed. So this episode did a lot for me and Sam's arc. What I know I don't want to see is him bringing Isaiah Bradley's story to light. That would be such a betrayal of trust when that man was betrayed so much that he's traumatized by it. But In terms of like what more I need from Sam, I think I would love for him to prove Zemo wrong, both 
he and Bucky relied on Zemo so much and let him take the lead on everything but how to handle Carly and the Flag Smashers. Yeah. I want to see Sam validated in believing that not everything has to come down to bloodshed. And I would love to see him do it in an African-made Captain America suit with vibranium wings. I love that. Yeah, it's it's true because even in this episode, Bucky and Sam are talking about what's going to happen with Carly. They say she's going to double down. Mm -hmm. And Bucky says, Zemo says there's only one solution. And so I love what you're saying that like what would be helpful is for Sam's approach of more compassionate nonviolence first you know, enforcement would be where we go with Carly because attacking Carly in some ways is punching down, right? Mm -hmm. Because yes, they are terrorists and they're being violent, but they're doing it as we talked about on character cast, you know, from a a position of injustice as opposed to John Walker, for example, because what I do want to see is Sam, I guess I want to see the good man beat the perfect soldier in front of the entire world. You know, like, while I want to see this nonviolent approach taken, like a compassionate approach taken with Carly, I think John Walker is going to need corrective action in the superhero way. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing these two versions of Captain America uh, taking, taking this sort of fight on in front of the whole world and that Sam, by virtue of being, again, the better person, not the stronger hero, not the soldier, not the guy with more medals, not the, you know, celebrated, uh, you know, Aryan looking dude. I don't know. I just I hope I hope we see some of that while Carly is, is treated with a little more compassion. So when it comes to Sam um, defeating or dealing with this perfect soldier, do you want him to defeat him with extreme prejudice? Uh, no. I or <laughs> like how far do you want him to go? Right. So I expect him to humble John Walker. I don't expect him to kill John Walker. I think that would have tremendous horrible consequences, both for Sam as a person and also, you know, for the world at large watching this, which there may still be anyway. And we'll get into some of that potentially in a bit. Ooh. I will say there's one other thing I want to see from Sam, though, which is to get over this brotherly paternalistic bullshit when it comes to Sarah and let her have some damn fun. That's something I want to see. Fun with Bucky? All right. Are you ready for this? Is it time for this? It might be time for this. All right. So let's officially move to talking about Bucky now. But we have to begin here with this whole situation. We need to talk about the chemistry with Sarah. We have to talk about that right now. What did you think? I'm here for it. I thought it was so fucking adorable and organic. I nearly died. Like, listen, I've never seen someone characterize. Hi, I'm Bucky. I'm Sarah. (laughs) Sarah. As flirting. Like, in what world is that flirting? It was just, oh, my God, it was so cute. I absolutely loved everything about it. What did you think? Something Amanda said to me while we were watching was, in a lot of ways, Sarah's pretty old fashioned in terms of her focus and energies and would be just such an interesting match for Bucky, right? Like, just right. like the old, t- like Sarah just wants to like do stuff with family, work on her house, like run her business. It's just like classic shit that I feel like Bucky would really take to, especially because we saw he can obviously be very helpful in when it comes to these enterprises. So... I just feel like they would they would pretty deeply connect like it's they wouldn't be oil and water in 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 sort of their interests and hobbies and instincts like I don't know I saw I saw a lot there and and yeah they I mean, have two of the biggest smiles on the show and uh ever at any point when they're looking at each other and it really speaks to again the talent of both of them as actors that just that little moment you talked about cuz on the dialogue if you read that page of the script right that cannot possibly jump out at you right. until you see the performances inhabited fully by the actors. So, yeah, Bucky and Sarah, I definitely need it to happen. It's so cute. I do have a question, though. Hmm. What do you think about the fact that they've paired Bucky with nothing but women of color during this show? The waitress was API. We've shipped him with IO. I mean, yeah. nothing confirmed about that, but we've done it here on that podcast. Now, Sarah, any thoughts on that? I I don't have anything specific other than that I think it's hard to argue with any of those individual choices. All of those women are great, interesting, powerful women in their own right. 
And I, you know, I guess I hadn't sort of thought about it as the fact that like, you know, since 1940, whatever, has Bucky dated a single white woman? <laughs> Probably not, I guess, if you, if you really think about it. The last one was, you know, Jenna Coleman, right? The, the, How the, the, the woman he was watching the Howard Stark Expo with. So I don't know. I guess I just feel like each of those individual choices made a lot of sense to me. And I hadn't thought about it in a more sort of comprehensive Bucky way. What do you think about that? I have no idea. <laughs> like, I hadn't really formulated any thoughts. I just wanted to be messy and ask that question. I love it, but though. I love it. I, I, mean, I mean, listen, I'm here for it. Sebastian Stan is hot as fuck. And if a woman of color can land that girl, have yourself a field day and report back on what it's like. And Sam, get the fuck out of the way. I'll say it again. I just, you know, I'm over this sort of, uh, you know, patriarchal bullshit. Can you imagine the Christmases, though? Like, the jokes that Bucky would make to Sam, like the inappropriate jokes. Like, I would watch an entire show just based on that shit. Well, and here's the thing, right? Let's say someday, like, Io comes and visits uh, over, like, a holiday, like you're saying, yeah. The number one priority for the nephews has to be to learn how to disable that arm. And then, you know, <laughs> yeah. when they're teenagers and they're having some yes. fight, they're going to go like doop, doop, doop and like make yes. Bucky's arm fall off in the middle of the argument. Like that's that's the family drama shit I need to see from the MCU. Oh, I love that. That's brilliant. All right. So Bucky came, obviously, to drop off this package, but he then decided to stick around and help the Wilson family, help Sam out. Why do you think he did that? What was he looking for consciously or subconsciously? So I think the cynical answer might be that they remind him of his time in Wakanda when oh. he had a little piece. Yeah. You know, Sam's nephews waking him up while he was on the couch is a call back to the end credit scenes of Black Panther when the Wakandan kids were waking him up. Right. But I mean, I think the real answer is that he's simply looking for family. You know, his family can't be a shield. I'm sorry, Bucky. Like, it, it can't be. So this is something that he's craving. He's, he spent his whole day having a great time fixing the boat, laughing with Sam and the community. He needs people, like his therapist said. He needs a chosen family. And I feel like he had a taste of that. It's right there at his fingertips in Louisiana. Look, I take your point technically that calling a shield family maybe isn't super healthy. That said, if it's the only family he has left, then I do think maybe he wanted to be where it was or at least check in on its new home, right? He wanted oh. to see how the little shield was doomed because, you know, honestly, obviously, I think subconsciously he was hoping that there was maybe room for him too. If there's room for the shield in this new family, maybe there's a little room for Bucky too. Because, you know, he, of course he was like, I'll sign it and I'll be on my way. But I definitely took that as the way when you like drop in on someone and you're hoping to hang out and you're like, I'm sure you're busy. I just wanted to like drop this off. But then you're hoping that you get to like spend all afternoon drinking on the porch or whatever. I mean, listen, he also baited Sam in having a place to stay. Like, sure oh, I'm going to catch my flight and I'm going to get a hotel. I love the fact that Sam called him out on it. Yeah. Like, Bucky, come on. <laughs> They connected so powerfully this episode. It was heartwarming to see, even though they didn't call themselves partners. Well, Bucky did. Well, Bucky did. Right. Sam was like, maybe not. Let's not walk up to that line. We're yet. co-workers. But Bucky <laughs> did finally seem to take Sam's advice to start defining himself. What do you hope Bucky is able to see and accept about himself when this is all over? If he's going to look at himself and start, you know, making his own qualities, things that he yeah. says about himself. What do you want to see him name and accept? I hope that Bucky realizes that he's a wonderful human being who is absolutely gorgeous when he smiles. <laughs> we, we, we finally get to see Bucky smile and laugh this episode, and it was wonderful. I would like to see more Bucky smiles, please. And I hope that he can accept that we all have a dark side. Every single last one of us has a winter soldier inside of us. Yeah. But I know that's hard to realize or accept when your best friend was fucking Steve Rogers, a man almost universally idolized as a symbol of goodness and wholesomeness. So I hope the more friendships he develops, the more he realizes that flaws run deep in us all. And to put it in Amanda terms from StoryCast, we all have a little goofus and gallant in all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Man, yeah, that was a wild ride. Um, <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, 
Bucky, like America, has committed unforgivable sins, right? And and yeah. whether he was in total control of them isn't really necessarily the point. White people who are alive today and meanwhile didn't create the racist world we inhabit, but it's a part of us. It's benefited us. It's shaped who we are. And it's what we do going forward that matters. So I hope Bucky's yes. able to sort of take some of that away to sort of tie him back into the sort of Sam and Isaiah conversation. I also think we learned that Bucky likes to fix things and build things. So I hope he realizes that there was some joy in that work and he finds his way to do more of that. Because look, maybe, maybe this isn't the most cinematic future for Bucky, but I could see him like starting a community housing nonprofit for displaced folks. I think he'd be good at it. That'd be so nice. That would be nice. One thing I want for Bucky, I want him to be in nature wherever he is because mm. he seems to thrive when he is in that type of setting. So like, of course, he he calls Wakanda his time of peace, right? He had his major breakthrough there. He seemed to really thrive and enjoy his time there. Then he has another breakthrough in Louisiana with Sam, beautiful bayou area, you know, beautiful trees at the Walker family home. And and you contrast that with the fake nature background of that therapist room that yeah. he was in where he was totally bullshitting her the whole time. Yeah. He's super honest when he's actually in nature. Um, so I really want Bucky to get out of the city. Like, go see Yori. Do what you need to do with Yori. But if you're going to go start these community projects and helping displaced people, which is an idea I just fucking love, I hope it's like in more rural settings where he's got some quiet and peace and he could commune with nature because he seems to be doing really well when he has that ability. Well, you and Bucky have something in common, which is that you're both New York City kids. Yes. Big up to Brooklyn. What does it say about Bucky then? I'm into what you're saying about him with nature, but what does it say about him that, you know, he grew up in the metropolis and now maybe nature is his, you know, way home, way path forward? Sometimes in order to grow and thrive, you have to get out of where you grew up. Not every environment is going to be the right environment for you to thrive in, even if that's home, even if that's your original home, right? So... Yeah, a lot of times because there's toxicity in where you grow up, the only way to heal from it is to get out of it, get a different perspective. So, yeah, I mean, listen, I love New York. I was born in Brooklyn. I was raised out in Queens. I think it's the center of the universe. But I've grown so much by leaving it, experienced so much by leaving it, Um and even when I've, you know, created roots here in the Washington, D.C. area, I still try to get out of it as often as possible to, like, clear my mind and get a fresh take on things and de-stress. Because so much of the things that drive me absolutely out of my mind are right here in my backyard, you know? So, yeah, I think sometimes you just... Got to get out and try something new and get a different perspective to clear your mind. I couldn't think of like a cool single word name for the Bucky Sarah coupling pair. Is there one? Is there a way to like refer to them? Sarky? Sarky? That sounds so Sarky, terrible. Yeah. It's yeah. Like <laughs> what, what, what a lovely and charming phrase. No, look, let's, <laughs> let's ponder that some. <laughs> <laughs> uh, while we talk about Sarah, the other half of this potentially exciting uh, burgeoning relationship, why do you think she finally let up on Sam in his meddlesome ways? I mean, did she? She mm. read his ass the riot act for meddling with the water pump oh, after she specifically told his ass to leave him alone. But she also told him maybe I was a little hard on you outside of the bank. Yeah. And I didn't really yeah, mean yeah. that shit about you, you know, running away. I basically, I didn't mean you were a coward. And I'm sort of sorry I said that. But also you're a sensitive little flower. Which I yeah, thought was he's a hilarious. sensitive little flower. So sweet. I mean, I think his meddling was actually productive this time around, right? right? <laughs> he got the community involved. Progress was made. It wasn't like at the bank when Sarah knew that shit was a foregone conclusion. And I think she has some empathy for him this time around. 
He shared with her Isaiah's story, which I think gives her a lot of context for the internal struggle and pressures that Sam is facing right then and there. So she's not going to pile on, you know, she's being a good sister, but instead she steers Sam into focusing on the best way to fix the boat. I yeah. think she I think she actually learns the same lesson that Sam learned this episode. It's OK to accept help when you need it. It's OK to acknowledge that you're in need. Don't be don't be proud about it. You know, community exists for the mutual aid of one another. And the Wilsons can't be the only ones doling out help all the time. They have to be able to ask for and accept it, too. I love that. I also think Sam was being really present in the moment when he was there in Delacroix with the family and the yeah. community. Whereas I, I get the impression that generally when he comes in, one, he's kind of doing some kind of flyby. And two, his mind is often elsewhere whether that's not on the family or not on the community. And I think she just responded and let down her guard a little bit by seeing that Sam was fully there and present in the moment. Yeah. And I think that meant a lot to her. Ha ha, flyby. I know, yeah, sorry. That was kind of, <laughs> yeah, that's a, mm, yeah. Falcon doing a flyby. It is Sarah the best mom in the MCU? We don't have a lot of other candidates, so maybe she wins by default, but is she the best mom we've seen in the MCU? She's certainly better than fucking Laura Barton based on Laura's hot dog condiment offerings alone. Mustard or mayo? The yeah. fuck is she talking about? No relish, no kraut. Get the fuck out of here, Laura. Feed your kids properly, please. Yeah. And it's hard to say that she's not better than Wanda, who, you know, maybe caused her <laughs> right. kids to be created and now potentially burning in hell. So not a great situation. Not a great situation from Wanda either. I do think Sarah has some stiff competition from Maggie Lang. Huh. She's pretty great just based on how freaking awesome Cassie Lang turned out. Um, but some of that might have to do with Scott. And I haven't seen Maggie try to feed hungry kids who aren't her own while struggling financially. Right. Um, by the way, on Wednesday, you'll be able to hear Mark, my co-host Jocelyn, and I extol the many virtues of Cassie Lang on the I'm a Need More Wine podcast. Yeah, we definitely get into some Ant-Man shit. And it was uh, my first official guest appearance anywhere. And it was so much fun. You guys definitely need to listen to the I'm a Need More Wine podcast if you aren't already. And we're going to have you back. Jocelyn and I have already been talking about like what episode we can do to get you back on because we had such a good time. Oh, well, thank you. I did too. But yes... For me, Sarah is the best mom in the MCU, but I would like to acknowledge Aunt May, though. Aunt May is owned by Sony, so <laughs> I'm not including her in the competition because the question was cabin to the MCU. But I would like to say, as someone who is babysitting their puppy nephew right now and he's licking up his water and making all types of noise in the background, I would like to say that Aunt Moms are moms, too. I think if you sleep with someone else in the MCU, in an MCU movie, you definitely are in the MCU. I think Aunt May is in the MCU. If she can have sex with Happy Hogan, she is physically present in the MCU. <laughs> and they definitely did it. At like, least her bodily happened. fluids are. Well, right? right, right, right. I mean, she did say it was like a little summer fling. So we might be losing her after Spider-Man 3. But yeah, I think Aunt May is a pretty good runner up. One of the things I loved about watching Sarah be a mom was that she does set rules for her kids. But she also understands that like life is kind of about breaking them too. I go back to that video game moment where she's like, no video games. And then they're like, to yeah. her face, you know, yes, video games. And, you know, like that kind of interplay where kids and moms alike understand both sides of that kind of rulemaking is like a really fun and healthy relationship. And so a lot of TV in the last like 50 to 75 years made by white guys usually is about like bad moms and moms suck. And, you know, yeah. you know, whether it's like Don Draper, who we talked a little bit about on Storycast and all these things, you know, it can, it's very easy to demonize mothers, um, especially with all these like, you know, dudes running around making these shows. And so I love just seeing like healthy motherhood in a show and it's, you know, not a thing. So. Yeah, Disney does not have the best track record on moms. No. I mean, every fucking Disney movie I watched growing up had either an evil stepmother or mom got murdered. So like, I'm very, very, very happy for Wholesome Sarah. Well, the opposite of Wholesome is whatever the fuck John Walker is. Let's oh boy. talk a little bit about Walker. I only have one question on John Walker, which is this. He is a monster. But he is mm -hmm. not totally wrong that he was made this way that, you know, they built him or whatever. 
But I want to know, Christine, how do you apportion blame for who he is now? So it's true. Walker isn't wrong when he says, I only ever did what you asked of me. Um, But listen, I can't give you percentages, but I blame Walker more than I blame the institutions that created him. And I might be in the minority here on that, which is cool. Uh, To be clear, I blame them both. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. The U.S. military literally breaks you down in order to rebuild you into the vision they have for you. And usually that vision is a toxically masculine murderous machine that won't hesitate to kill someone and believes in American superiority. Walker is their monster and the government is Dr. Frankenstein. Oh, I love that. Damn. And listen, maybe Walker was a great guy going into the service, and that might be evidenced by his friendship with Lamar and his relationship with his wife, both of which I think go back to high school. So maybe the military ruined that great guy. And yet Sam also had American military training and doesn't make the same choice as Walker makes. Neither does Torres. Not to mention, Walker moves like a man who benefits from white supremacy, white privilege, and patriarchy, but is completely ignorant of all of these systems and how they made him into who he is today. And how can he be that ignorant (laughs) when his best friend is black and his wife is black? He might even be raising black children for all we know. Right. So do you know how much of an asshole you have to be to move through life like that? The system is at fault, certainly. Yeah. The Countess was absolutely right. Walker did the GRC a favor. He just got caught doing it in an impolitic way. Right. And, and trauma plays a role because he was triggered by Lamar's death. So Walker is shaped by all of these things. But what keeps me blaming him more than the institutions around him is the lying and the revisionist history that he's trying to push. There's just something about all of that that just doesn't sit well with me. Lamar went through most of the same experiences, which we know because they grew up together. They went into the military together. They served together. They went through their most harrowing experiences in life together. And then they became Captain America and Battlestar together. That's about as close to an identical experience as you can have to what John went Mm -hmm. through. But at every turn, Lamar was more human, right? He was more sympathetic to the Flag Smashers. He understood why people were compelled by Carly. He wasn't perfect, but he, you know, he, I think, was a little more patient, a little more wise. And that means that you can't just say, well, John Walker was built by the U.S. military and he has no agency here. I totally agree with your assessment that it's mostly his fault you know, and, and for me, maybe second place is even less the military and more just sort of general white silence, you know, and, and like yeah. the inability and unwillingness of white communities to have any of these conversations about, you know, why he's the quarterback at the majority black high school. You know, it probably mm-hmm. could have had some conversations there that, that would have maybe turned John Walker into a more sympathetic person. I do think, unfortunately, there are a lot of white people in this world who have black friends, maybe even black spouses who still in their hearts, don't really talk or think about this at a level Mm -hmm. that, you know, can kind of generate some of the breakthroughs that we sure fucking wish John Walker would have. Because I always think, too, about like rich kids, right? Rich kids Mm -hmm. who have shitty attitudes about poor folks, they were definitely set up by their inherited privilege to feel that way, but they can also unpack that, right? They can do more than be defensive about being rich or their privilege or whatever. So, I think if we can expect rich people to be compassionate, we can also hold John accountable to put humanity before duty. Yes. That's what it comes down to. He just did not see these people as human. He really didn't. He did not recognize Nico's humanity when he was on that monument screaming, it wasn't me, and putting his hands up in defense of himself. Well, the other person who you know, people are holding out as potentially a villain of this show is Carly. And something we talked about on StoryCast was that, like Isaiah, Carly is traumatized by her past and has a very understandable loathing for elitist government. I'm curious if you see similarities between Carly and Isaiah, or are they fundamentally different? I mean, I do think they're similar. They're both radicalized, but in opposite directions. While Isaiah's trauma leads him to retreat into his own world and create a personal utopia for himself 
that's free of outsiders and thoughts of either the past or future, Carly's trauma leads her to create a new world for everyone, to have a chosen family of multitudes where everyone is equal, clothed, sheltered, and fed. So for me, Isaiah's trauma robbed him of all of his optimism, while Carly's trauma fuels hers. She's called to action, and Isaiah is called to solitude. That's interesting. I do see them as opposites because, you know, Isaiah, like you said, is, is compelled to solitude and she is compelled to violence. But I don't know that I see her as optimistic. That's really interesting because I do think she has a very clear idea of how to tear things down. But we still have mm-hmm. never heard a positive vision. And I don't mean positive like happy. I mean, positive like a a specific vision of what she would build in its place. What system is she going to create in the absence of these existing governments and her one world government, what does that look like? I don't actually honestly think she has an answer to that. So I I don't think she needs one Mm. when it comes to optimism. I think she believes that she can enact change. I don't know what exactly the change is other than tearing down these systems, Mm -hmm. right? Like what she wants to rebuild in its place, of course, still unclear, but she believes that she can do it. She believes that the flag smashers have the power, the wherewithal, and the vision to make it happen. But Isaiah's like, this system is toxic. It is built into the fabric and foundation of this country. It's not going away. Why bother? I do think Carly is right. And we, as the audience, are able to see that even separate from her lens because we see the GRC discussing people in dehumanizing ways. They are right. definitely, right, uncaring elites who want civility more than actual fairness or equity. So I do think her cynicism and bitterness are justified. One, one difference that jumped out at me, though, was the number of people who can still be made whole in light of the thing that they are cynical about, right? Isaiah is made cynical by 500 years of Mm -hmm. inconceivable injustice, whereas Mm -hmm. Carly is made cynical by five months of it. And I don't know that that means that she is unjustified, but Isaiah's truth is undeniable. And I'm not sure Carly's is yet. I mean, I think discrimination and oppression is discrimination and oppression, whether it's been for 500 years or it's been for five months, right? Like if you have been living a certain life and suddenly the government strips you of it yeah. without recompense, that's an injustice. Mm-hmm. You know, like, listen, we can't really compare the blip to anything in our real world, right? Like, we've just got to, like, have a bit of fantasy for a moment to kind of really put ourselves in Carly's shoes. And it's difficult. It's really freaking difficult. But at the end of the day, these people still need to be made whole. And quite frankly, I think because there's been such a short amount of time, it might be possible or like there's there's a realm of possibility of getting close to reparations for these folks who have been displaced. So I feel like, yes, Carly has been sitting with these feelings for five months, but they're pretty egregious feelings and they need to be addressed. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point, actually. So I will let off of being hard on Carly for that. I mean, you could still be hard on Carly, but (laughs) maybe not necessarily for that. No, that's, that's a good point. One more person to talk about, Christine. Last but not least, Zemo. In the last episode, Zemo insisted he was not going to leave his work unfinished. But in this episode, he seemed real comfortable with dying and also being arrested. So why did he kind of give up in this episode? So from the beginning, I think Zemo always knew that he was on borrowed time and this was a quick jaunt. You know, because why else would he leave the clue about the Sokovia Memorial for Bucky? That was a definite breadcrumb and intentional. Zemo's been very careful about his leverage. He left that as a clue for Bucky. Um, he expected Bucky to show up and kill him because, you know, that he he thinks that that's Bucky's programming. Right. That's his cynicism about Bucky. He was, he had made his peace with that because he has 
his specialty, right, is getting Titans to fight amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think he sees that a showdown between John, Bucky, Carly, Sam, the whole gang is coming. And I think he's betting that they will, some of them will kill each other. And the rest will have such a bloody fight in front of the entire world that millions more people will turn against super soldiers, superheroes, all the things that he opposes. So I think he's at peace because his plan is in motion again, just like at the end of Civil War, he's comfortable dying because he has put his plan in motion here. He's taken it to a whole other level. And between Sokovia, Westview, New Jersey, and whatever the hell's about to go down at the GRC headquarters, the world is turning against quote unquote heroes. Mm -hmm. So I do think Zemo can be content in that knowledge and he's not wrong that his plan is working. So listen, this isn't a question about Zemo, but it is a question about this scene or maybe it's not even a question, but like, I find it very interesting that the Wakandans have access to the raft. Like, yeah. who is maintaining the raft right now? Because that used to be, what, a shield thing, It was right? Ross. Or, Thunderbolt Ross was on the raft. Yeah. Well, now I'm curious, so, like, what do you think the Wakandans should have done with Zemo? Should they? Because I, I, I don't like the idea of them taking him to the raft. That actually did sit wrong with me. And I hadn't thought about that in, again until you just said it. So, like, when I was kind of gaming it out, I was like, oh, maybe this is a remnant of the blip period where maybe, you know, governments came together and they were like, the most evil among us will be put on the raft. And maybe that's why they still have access, because I would think Wakanda has a pretty secure jail somewhere or maybe Wakandans believe in abolition and they're like, we're not jailing anybody and we're only going to jail white people. Listen, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, that would fine. make sense to me is that they're like, we're sort of post carceral in the way that right. we administer justice. And the only people that we'll make exceptions for are basically colonizers who need to go get put somewhere into some kind of other system because we don't need that shit here. Right. But I'm assuming that Listen, again, I have not read the comic books, but I've seen enough comic book movies to know that when you get a whole bunch of bad guys together, shit happens. And I'm wondering if like the raft is just like Arkham. It and is. And we're going to yeah. get a band of, of evildoers and Zemo's going to be part of it. Yeah. Surefire way to sell a bunch of comic books is indicate that a bunch of bad guys have been in the same jail system for a while and that they are the new Sinister Six or whatever the group's going to be. Brotherhood of Evil. You know, there's all kinds of things that can come from putting a bunch of uh, people into a system that, you know, has absolutely no hope of any kind of you know rehabilitation or whatever. It's just not on the table uh, because the system is they're not even trying, which is super fucked up. Yeah. Or they can be the next Ant-Man team. That was a group of ex cons. Well, that's true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying, like, the system isn't even trying to help. Yeah, no. I don't know. That was a uh, that was really that was a really wonderful conversation. I really I thank you for you know taking the time and really giving giving us uh, the the perspective you've got on Isaiah, on Sam, Bucky, Sarah, everybody. Thank you, Christine. Well, well it's my pleasure. It's a little cathartic to share it. I do have one question for you before we leave. Yeah, please. Um, so one character we didn't get a chance to talk about is Sharon. You know, her appearance was hella brief, but it was pretty important. So she says to Batrock that she'll offer him double for this next gig. But what was the previous gig? Do we think Sharon's been a part of this story since the opening scene? She has to be. That's the only other gig we know of. She clearly paid Batrock to do the hostage taking that kicked off the entire series. It's just super unclear what the objective there would have been other than to hold that guy hostage for the money that they clearly thought they were going to get. There's no, I just don't see a way back for Sharon at this point. I think she is going to be, I think we're going to learn that she's working with the Contessa, that the Contessa is sort of a post shield operative who is now setting up her own thing in the comics. She actually becomes Madame Hydra which is like a whole mm-hmm. other thing. That's pretty recent. I only really grew up knowing her as like Nick Fury's on again, off again partner. And by that, I mean like actual like romantic partner. Like ah. uh, they were a thing and she's Italian in the comics. And yeah, she just wasn't really like a huge character, but I think they've gone back to her more recently. So I'll be 
doing some reading on that now that we've seen the character. I'm going to look at some of those more recent stories. But I just, I, right? I mean, do, do you think Sharon is, at this point, there's no no scenario in which they, they go, surprise, she's still a good guy. There's absolutely no way. I think Sharon asking for that pardon was a smokescreen, you know, to kind of keep Sam and Bucky thinking that, oh, she's still on the side of good and whatnot. And if she gets a pardon, she'll walk away from Madripoor and we can bring her home and yada, yada, yada. Um, when meanwhile, she's giving somebody money whose whole objective is killing Sam. Yeah. <laughs> like, she's not interested in that pardon. I mean, this every episode is just adding more and more fuel to the Sharon is the power broker theory. I, in particular, because she says she'll give him double. Not that she can get him double. Ooh, yeah. She's offering the money. That's true. Maybe so, she is pulling the strings there. We talked on StoryCast about how the impressionist painting that she has from Monet kind of signals something about a more egalitarian perspective on art. And we talked about maybe the counterpoint being that other big painting we see in the hallway. But there was an incredible Reddit post actually about that painting, which is called The Raft of the Medusa. And actually, it was apparently like really shunned by the artistic elite when it was painted in the early 1800s. Because it centers a black man at the top in the sort of heroic position of having survived this shipwreck. And it was considered just outrageous to put uh, a black character in that position in the middle of like a this big, you know, huge heroic style art painting. It was a radical choice. Mm -hmm. And if they're trying to make a commentary about Sharon with the art, as opposed to just using the art to comment on the broader story, then there may still be something there. But my guess is the art they're featuring is meant to comment more on Falcon and the Winter Soldier as a series and what it's about than Sharon. Yeah, because I think if you add Sharon to the mix, what she's doing is trying to sell it. So, so this black man being a hero is something for Sharon to exploit. Hmm. You know, it's special and has more value because of the history behind the painting, right? Like, it was seen as controversial, and this was the first time this was done, and yada, yada. And all of that jacks up the price, which is what she's interested in. Right. So it still doesn't have her in a good light because she's profiting on the struggle that Sam is going through. I mean, because the character in that painting had to survive a fucking shipwreck, right? Like this is a traumatized individual coming out as triumphant, which is similar to Sam's arc, but yet Sharon's the one making the money off of it. Damn. Add that to the Reddit. Yeah, let's, yeah, come back to us, Reddit. <laughs> Take this part and make sure people hear what Christine has to say because that's actually blowing my mind twice over. Wow. Yeah, Christine. Given all this amazing insight, people probably want to know, where can I hear more from this wonderfully smart person? Where can people find and follow you? Well, you can find and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Kippens K. And for less than smart takes, you can always listen to me oh, stop. on the I'm a Need More Wine podcast with my co-host, Jasper. Very smart takes on that show, too. We have a lot of fun. There. Yeah, it's a blast. Uh, OK, Podcast Powerhouses, that is the show for today. Please check out StoryCast. Keep an eye out for PondaVision. Go subscribe to I'm Gonna Need More Wine. And if you're enjoying this show, tell a friend or leave us a five-star app overview. One of those two would really make a huge difference for us. All right, Christine, until next time, let's take Sam's old wings and make a suit because, you know, I'm telling you, Joaquin is the new Falcon. Joaquin is so the new Falcon. But hello, my wings need to be made of vibranium. I'm not taking anything less than Wakandan tech. Damn.